The first law of thermodynamics says that energy is conserved. This is something that you utilized in general chemistry one to be able to find the change of energy of a system uh, by looking at the heat and work and the conversion between kinetic and potential energies. Now, since energy is conserved, that means that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Energy can be transferred between a system and its surroundings or the way, other way around, but the energy will not disappear. Uh, energy can be converted from one form to the other, for example, like I've mentioned, between kinetic and potential energy, or between heat and work, and the total energy of the universe remains constant. The second law of thermodynamics says that spontaneous processes always result in an overall increase in the entropy of the universe. Another way to put it is that in any spontaneous process that occurs, the entropy of the universe or the change in the entropy of the universe is going to be greater than zero. Here what it says is that the driving force for a spontaneous process to occur is an increase in the entropy or disorder of the universe. One way to remember this is to think about uh, the fact that uh, it is kind of very easy for uh, our houses or our, our rooms or our offices to get disorganized, right? Uh, the spontaneous thing is for disorder to occur. We actually have to put in some work to maintain order. So this is something, you know, an easy way to think about it, like a spontaneous process is going to result in an increase in the disorder or the entropy of the universe. And I do want to, before I move on, I do want to point out that here we're talking about the entropy of the universe. Uh, I'm not talking about necessarily the entropy of a chemical reaction because that is our system. The system is only a part of the universe. So we could still have a reaction for which the entropy change is uh, decreasing, but it might still be spontaneous and we're going to see under what conditions that might be the case. So here, just keep in mind, we're talking about a spontaneous process is going to cause a, an increase in the entropy for the whole universe as a whole. All right, uh, before we do that, the third law of thermodynamics says that the entropy of a pure, perfectly ordered crystalline substance at the absolute zero temperature is zero. So first of all, absolute zero temperature. You guys might remember that this is what we call zero degrees Kelvin. Zero degrees Kelvin is the theoretic, theoretically smallest temperature or that we could get to. At that temperature, basically all motion of the molecules at the atomic level would cease. Uh, and so this is really a theoretical uh, zero is something that we cannot achieve in an experiment or anything like that, right? But it's basically defining what is the most order that we could possibly have. So if we have a pure crystalline solid where the atoms are completely organized in a pattern, uh, close packed together, and the molecule has zero temperature, meaning that it has no energy, then you have basically perfect order, right? And so by definition, the entropy at that condition would be equal to zero because it's perfect order, so zero disorder. Now, um, what was I gonna say? So another way to put it is that at zero degree Kelvin, uh, basically you have only one microstate because of the lack of motion and the complete uh, order of that crystal, so no disorder. All right, so having said this, let's go ahead and do a clicker question. Uh, it says, a certain process has an entropy change of the universe that is greater than zero at 25 degrees Celsius. Key thing here is entropy change of the universe is greater than zero. What does one know about the process? And go ahead and pause the video and give it a try. All right, so the answer is that it is spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, the temperature really doesn't matter, except that we're saying that we are at the same conditions in this problem and in the answer, right? But basically, if you have an entropy change for the universe that is greater than zero, that means that you have a spontaneous process. Now, some of you might have thought about this exothermic because early on in the slides, I mentioned that most spontaneous processes are exothermic. 
And so you might have thought, okay, so if this is the case, then I have a spontaneous process, then it might be exothermic. And that might be true for most of the cases, but we said specifically that it was not true all the time. So most, I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite it. Most spontaneous processes are exothermic, but not all. So obviously A could not be true all the time. Spontaneous processes are, oops, my tablet is dying. <laughs> are exothermic. Oh, come on, right? But not all. Yeah. So that's why this is not the case. And the other ones were just, yeah, just dummies. All right, let's go ahead and move on. So the next part that we're gonna be talking about is gives free energy. So we have mentioned so far that uh, entropy uh, has to do with the spontaneity of our reaction, right? And we specifically said that the entropy of the universe had to increase in order for our reaction to be spontaneous. But it would be very, very hard for us to go and calculate things about the universe, specifically the disorder level for a whole universe, right? The universe is everything. And so that's something that, that's just not really achievable. So what we could do would be to do measurements of what's happening to our system, you know, to the chemical reaction that we have of interest. And uh, so there is a way uh, through this Gibbs free energy calculation to be able to predict the spontaneity of a system by looking at changes that are occurring at the system. This is what Gibbs free energy change is. So delta G stands for the change in the Gibbs free energy and is provided typically in the units of kilojoule per mole. And this is going to be equal to the change in the enthalpy of the system minus the temperature in degrees Kelvin times the change in the entropy for that system. So again, for a system, we can look at this delta G and we're going to have, uh, on the next slide, I'm gonna tell you how does the value of delta G actually tell you about the spontaneity of, us, of, this, of the reaction? Um, one thing that I wanted to point out here is that you wanna make sure that the units are consistent in all three terms. If you want to calculate the delta G in kilojoules per mole, then your enthalpy change has to be in kilojoules per mole as well and the entropy will need to be in kilojoules per mole Kelvin. So just ensure that all of your units are in kilo, kilo, and kilo, just to make sure that you don't end up adding joules to, uh, to kilojoules. The temperature, of course, has to be in degrees Kelvin, so that's another thing that you wanna make sure that you remember to convert. If the temperature is given to you in degrees Celsius, you can add 273 to get it into Kelvin. As I mentioned, we're going to utilize the Gibbs free energy, which is our delta G, to predict the spontaneity of our process. And we can also utilize the equation in order to find at what temperature, meaning at what T, that, uh, that process becomes spontaneous. And we're gonna have examples of both calculations in just a little bit. All right, so I mentioned that we were gonna use Gibbs free energy to determine if a, if a reaction for a system is spontaneous or not, right? And so what you need to remember is this right here. A process will be spontaneous in the forward direction at constant temperature and pressure if your delta G is less than zero. So basically for a particular reaction, we're going to calculate the enthalpy for that reaction, we're going to calculate the, the change in the entropy for that reaction, and once we do this calculation, if the delta G ends up being less than zero, negative, then we know that the process is spontaneous under those conditions. Because of that, saying that you have a delta G that is less than zero is also the same thing as saying that the entropy of the universe is greater than zero, because both of these things mean that you have a spontaneous reaction happening, right? So if delta G is greater, I'm um, sorry, less than zero, negative, then the entropy change of the universe will be greater than zero because what we're talking about is a spontaneous reaction and both conditions apply to a spontaneous reaction. All right, so um, again, this is the equation that we would, that one of the equations that we will utilize to calculate the Gibbs free energy. Uh, and if the delta G is less than zero, 
That means that the reaction in the forward direction is spontaneous. If the delta G is equal to zero, it actually means that our reaction is at equilibrium. While if the delta G is greater than zero, that means that the, the reaction is not spontaneous in the forward direction, but it will be spontaneous in the reverse direction. When you think about it, the delta G being equal, equal to zero, the, at the equilibrium point, um, okay, okay, so if, let me back up. If the delta G is equal to zero, that means that the reaction is not really going anywhere. It's not spontaneous and it is not not spontaneous, right? Uh, so it's, it's, it's basically a place where the reaction is kind of stationary. And as we know, at equilibrium, your reaction is not changing concentrations anymore. You're not changing the ratios of the reactants to the products. In fact, you have reached the right ratios of reactants to products that the reaction is not going to change anymore unless you change some conditions, unless you affect that equilibrium, right? So basically that's what we're saying that delta G is going to equal to zero because the reaction is no longer spontaneous to continue forward and is not spontaneous for it to go in reverse either. Now, knowing the equation for the Gibbs free energy and understanding that the delta G being less than zero is spontaneous, what we're going to do here is to look at what happens if the value of the enthalpy is negative or positive, meaning that we have an exothermic versus an endothermic reaction. And what happens if the system is changing, is gaining or losing entropy? How do, how do those two change, changes affect the overall spontaneity of the system? In looking at this, you need to remember that the temperature in degrees Kelvin will always be greater or equal to zero. So there is no such thing as a negative value in the Kelvin scale. All right, let's look at the first scenario. What happens if my enthalpy is negative, meaning that I have an exothermic reaction? And I'm gonna go ahead and put a negative right under, heat, right under my delta H uh, here. All right, and then what happens if my entropy change is for the system? is positive. So my entropy change for the system uh, being positive, that means that um, the system itself is gaining entropy, not necessarily the universe. That's what we're going to figure out now. All right. So knowing this, now what we have to think is how does this affect the sign of the delta G? Because we know that delta G being less than zero means that the process is spontaneous. So of course we have a minus and then minus a positive number because remember that T is positive, right? So now that this is positive, that means that we're subtracting a positive number from a negative delta H. So what we're doing is that we're making it more negative. We're subtracting something from a negative number. We're making it more negative. Therefore, no matter what the value of the temperature is, our delta G is going to be a negative sign. And that's what it says right here. So if my reaction is exothermic and my system is gaining entropy because that particular reaction is gaining disorder, then that reaction is going to be spontaneous no matter what temperature we're using. So check for the first one. All right, and actually before I check, I'm gonna go and remove my pluses and signs so that I can begin a new one. Okay, let's look at the second one. So what happens if I have an endothermic reaction where my delta H is greater than zero, but I have a delta S that is negative. Delta S being negative, notice that now I have, I'm subtracting a negative number. That double negative means that I actually end up adding a positive value to my already positive delta H. So obviously if I'm adding a positive number to my already positive delta H, my answer, my delta G, will have no choice but to also be positive. That delta G being positive means that the reaction is going to be non-spontaneous regardless of the value of the temperature, because remember that the temperature is only positive. So check, we have basically figured out that the delta G for this case is always positive, meaning that we have a non-spontaneous reaction at all, at all temperatures. Of course, we know that what this means is that the delta G being negative means that the entropy change of the universe 
is greater than zero for this case, but is not so for this case. All right, now let's look at the next two scenarios. Let me again delete my little signs. Let's look at number three. Okay, so what happens if I have an exothermic reaction with a negative uh, delta H, but I also have a negative or a, cha uh, a negative change in the entropy, a decrease in my entropy for the system? All right, negative and negative means that this second term is actually adding a positive number to the delta H. So it really now depends on how big the delta H is relative to this. Or another way to look at it is, depending on how big this added term is relative to the delta H, this thing could go positive or it could be negative. So it would stay negative only if the temperature is low enough to make this term be little. So it could be, again, it could be negative, it could stay negative as long as this term that I'm adding here is small, which would happen only if I have a low temperature. So notice that here we say that the reaction at low temperature is going to be spontaneous because the delta G would be negative if I have a low temperature. On the other hand, if I have a large temperature, again, remember, negative and negative means that this is actually a positive thing. So if the temperature is really high, this term, which is positive, is going to be really, really large. And therefore, it is going to overcome the delta H and make the whole delta G be positive. So basically, at a high temperature, the delta G is positive and we have a non-spontaneous system. And if you don't mind, I'm going to go and write that down here. So at low temperature, we have a delta G that is uh, less than zero. And at a high temperature, we have a delta G that is greater than zero. All right, and now, oops, the last one is what happens if we have, oops, what happens if we have a, uh, let's see, a positive delta H, okay, so we're just gonna come and write here positive delta H, uh, meaning that we have an endothermic reaction, and we have also a positive delta S. All right, so in this case we have, we're subtracting a positive number, right? So that means that we are subtracting, we're making the delta H, we're, we're reducing the value of the delta H. So the delta H being positive and this guy subtracting from it, that means that the reaction could be, could have a delta G that is either positive or negative. If this term is large due to a large temperature, then the overall thing is going to be negative. And so we're actually going to have a spontaneous uh, reaction, again, because the delta G would be less than zero for a high temperature value. On the other hand, if we have a low temperature, then the delta H would be bigger than this, and the overall thing would be positive. And if the delta G is positive, we know that it would be a non-spontaneous reaction at that low temperature. I hope that you're able to understand my train of thought. If you have a real hard time thinking about this in the same way that I did, one thing that I would recommend is that you actually assign fictitious numbers to the delta H and the delta S. Let's say a thousand and a thousand. And then play with the temperatures choose a temperature that is like one degree Kelvin versus one temperature that is a million Kelvin or something like that, and see what does it give you for the delta G. See if you can understand, see if you can get the same things that we have here. The fact that, for example, here, you're gonna have a delta G that is less than zero, no matter what temperature you put. See if you get a positive delta G here in this scenario, no matter what temperature you put. While here, you're gonna see that if you have a low temperature, you're gonna get one sign, but if you get a high temp, if you use a high temperature, you're gonna get another sign. So give it a try and see if you can actually get it uh, in, a, in a different way using numbers. All right, in this problem, we're going to find delta G in kilojoules per mole at 298 degree Kelvin for the following reaction. At this temperature, the delta H, or enthalpy change, sorry, 
is 180.5 kilojoules per mole and the entropy change is equal to 24.9 joules per mole Kelvin. All right, so notice that what we are given uh, is the temperature. We are also given the delta H or enthalpy change and it's in kilojoules per mole. And finally, we're given the delta S or entropy change in joules per mole Kelvin. So we already know an equation that relates enthalpy and entropy to Gibbs free energy or delta G. So let's go ahead and write that down. So I know that my delta G is going to be equal to delta H minus T delta S. Before I plug anything in, I just want to make sure that I think about a couple of things. My temperature has to be in degree Kelvin and it already is. So we're good with that. My delta H and my delta S need to be in the same type of units, meaning either both in joules or both in kilojoules. Otherwise, I cannot end up adding, you know, apples to oranges. And in this particular case, they're asking us, asking us for the delta G in kilojoules per mole. So kilojoules for this one is good, but this one, on the other hand, is in joules per mole. So I'm going to go ahead and convert it. And the way that we do that is that the joules part of this needs to be converted to kilojoules. And so since the joule is in the numerator, we can say then, okay, times, whoops, I should do it on the side. Yeah, if you don't mind. So I'm going to put it here on the side. I have 24.9 joules per mole Kelvin. And then I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to put a conversion factor here that says that 1,000 joules, notice that I put it down here so that I can cancel the joules, is equal to 1 kilojoule. And so that means that now I can just do the division and I can write it as 0 0.0249. And that's kilojoules per mole Kelvin now. All right, so now we have actually our delta S in the proper units, and uh, we can actually come back and just plug everything in. So delta G is gonna be equal to our delta H, which is 180.5 uh, kilojoules oops, per mole Kelvin, minus my temperature, which is 298 Kelvin, times the delta S, which we said was 0. Point, come on, write, 0. 0.249 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. And I, I just saw that I made a mistake on my units for the enthalpy. Come on, write, please. Oh. Patience, patience, patience. Mole Kelvin. Here we go. There should not be any, any Kelvin on my enthalpy. That is always the case. Enthalpies do not have Kelvins, do not have temperatures in their units. All right, let's see if it will let me type, maybe. Kilojoules per mole. That's more like it. Okay, so this was my enthalpy term, then minus my temperature times my entropy change. And so now my delta G is going to be equal to 173.1 and the units are going to be kilojoules per mole because notice that the Kelvin right here cancel away and so both of the terms are in kilojoules per mole as they need to be for me to be able to subtract them from one another. If they were not in the same units I could not subtract them. Please write. <sighs> All right so that Ah, life. All right, so now, while well, the tablet decides whether it wants to write or not, uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you guys is, do you think that this is a spontaneous reaction or not? Well, hopefully you decided that because the sign of the delta G was positive, that means that this is a not spontaneous reaction and that means what for the change in the uh, entropy of the universe? All right, hopefully you got, a, you got to think about it. 
If it's not spontaneous, then that means that the delta S of the universe is actually less than zero, not greater than zero. Non-spontaneous process is not going to have a positive change for the universe. All right. In this next problem, if the tablet lets me write, I'm going to show you how to calculate the temperature at which a reaction is not spontaneous versus at which temperature it is spontaneous. So we are given a particular chemical reaction. We are given the enthalpy and the entropy for it. And so what we are going to do is that we know the equation that relates enthalpy, entropy, and Gibbs free energy, where the Gibbs free energy is what tells us whether the reaction is spontaneous or not. So we're going to use that equation. Let me go ahead and write it here. Delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Great. We know that if the delta G is less than zero, then that means that we have a spontaneous reaction, right? And then we know that if the delta G is greater than zero, that means that we have a non-spontaneous reaction. Awesome. So what happens if the delta G is equal to zero? Well, we already said that that's equal to equilibrium, but what else does that mean? Wow. Delta G equal to zero. Sure, delta G equal to zero means that we are at equilibrium, but it is also the threshold between which we have a spontaneous process versus a non-spontaneous process. So if we're able to solve at what temperature this delta G is equal to zero, then that would basically give us the threshold temperature below or above which we would have a spontaneous or a non-spontaneous system. So that's what we're going to do. Basically, when you have this kind of problem where you want to find out the temperature range with, where the reaction is either spontaneous or non-spontaneous, what you're going to do is that you're going to utilize the given enthalpies and entropy in this equation, and you're going to substitute the delta G with a zero to be able to find out what is the threshold temperature at which this changes from spontaneous to non-spontaneous. After we have the temperature, then we're going to think um, in, in some way, uh, we're going to figure out whether the temperature has to be greater than that threshold or lower than that temperature to make the system be non-spontaneous in this case. Now, before I do that, remember that when we plug in these values into this equation, we have to have them in the same set of units. So kilojoules and joules, one of the two is going to have to change. In this particular case, I did the same thing as in the previous problem, where I changed my joules to kilojoules, and I do that by dividing by a thousand. So I'm going to just say, okay, this is the same thing as negative 0 0.278 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. Awesome. So now we can begin. On the next page, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, go ahead and plug in numbers. So my delta G is going to be equal to zero, right? We're setting the delta G equal to zero. And so what I have is that zero is equal to my delta H minus my T delta S. Then I'm going to substitute with numbers uh, in a second, actually. I, I rather, as you guys already know me, I rather solve for my variable first and then plug in the numbers. So I'm actually going to take this whole term to the other side by adding T delta S on both sides. So I'm going to have T times delta S is equal to delta H. After that, I need T by itself. So I'm going to divide both sides by delta S. So I'm going to have T is equal to delta H divided by delta S. Now I have my temperature ready, so I can plug in. My delta H is going to be equal to, what was it, negative 249, and that was kilojoules per mole. And then my delta S is negative 0 0.278 kilojoule per mole Kelvin. 
Now notice that the kilojoules and the moles cancel away, but the Kelvin is going to come to the numerator, and that's going to give us a temperature of 896 Kelvin. So we have found the threshold temperature that separates the reaction from being spontaneous to being non-spontaneous. Now we need to figure out, is the temperature supposed to be higher than that to make it non-spontaneous, or it's supposed to be less than that to make it non-spontaneous? There's a number of ways to think about it. One of the ways is by looking at just the signs in the same way that we did in, that, uh, in the table a few slides ago. So basically what I do is that I rewrite my equation to help me think through this uh, and to help me explain what I'm thinking. And I say, okay, I know that my delta H, which was given to me already, you know, it's right here, it's a negative value, right? I know that my delta S, which was given to me, it's negative. So, and I'm going to put them in circles here just to, just to be able to see them properly. So I have a negative number here and I have a negative, negative and negative. Remember that negative, negative, since the temperature is always positive, that means that this whole thing is actually increasing the value, making it more and more positive. Now, in this particular problem, they told us to find the temperature at which the, del at, at which the system is non-spontaneous. Non-spontaneous means that the delta G is greater than zero, is a positive number. So what I need to think about is, does the temperature need to be greater than the 896 or less than the 896 to make this positive? So if I have a negative delta H, then this guy needs to actually be large for this whole thing to be positive. Again, let me say why. Because negative and negative means that this whole thing is actually being added as a positive number. So if this is big, then that's going to overcome the negative delta H to make the delta G be positive. So what I need is I need a large temperature. I need a temperature that is greater than my threshold. So I need, need the temperature to be greater than 896 Kelvin for my delta G, oops, to be greater than zero, which makes it non-spontaneous, which is what I was looking for. If you're not able to think about this in this way, if, if, you know, if my logic doesn't make sense to you, one easy thing that you can do is to just come back to the equation, plug in your enthalpy and plug in your entropy, and then try a number that is less than 896, and then try a number of temperature that is greater than 896, and that will right away give you a value of delta G that is either positive or negative. That way you are completely sure that your answer is correct. All right, that's that. Clicker question. In which case must a reaction be spontaneous at all temperatures? Give it a try, please. Please, please, please. All right, as you guys already saw, the way that I think about this is by looking at the equation and looking at the signs. Hopefully you guys are getting what I'm talking about here. Uh, okay, this is my equation. So what we're saying is that this thing needs to be spontaneous at all temperatures. Spontaneous means my, that my delta G is a negative number, right? For that to be the case, I want this to be negative. And this right-hand side, since I'm subtracting a number, I actually want my delta S to be a positive value so that basically regardless of what temperature I have, doesn't matter, I'm still going to be making the overall answer more and more negative by subtracting a positive value. So what I want is answer D, where I have delta H being negative, meaning an exothermic reaction in which the entropy change of the system is positive, basically a reaction in which the disorder of the system is increasing. All right.